Good morning, everyone. Sorry about the slight delay. Um, our third guest will be joining us very shortly. Um, welcome to the audio and visual streaming progression and promotion of music artists. Uh, we're very glad to be here as part of the Innovation Factory at Medem. Myself, I'm Yvette Chivers from Beats Foundation, and we do a live audio and visual streaming for festivals. That's our first, our first kind of target. I'm going to pass you over to my panelists here and let them introduce themselves. Um, Martin Rigby, I'm the CEO of Persona, which is a UK-based on-demand streaming service with a, um, a rather different business model to our competitors like Spotify and Deezer. Um, we monetize by letting users pay a very small amount per play, which they pay for typically through their mobile phone by buying, buying a very small amount of credit. So we're looking to deliver mobile streaming to people who are unbanked, don't have access to credit cards. Of course, big opportunity in the developing world. Um, and we're very excited about streaming, but I'll go into that later. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Medem. My name is Chris Dabbs. Um, I'm the chief executive of Streaming Tank, the end-to-end uh, -end live streaming agency, and the agency behind the world records, the world first, and almost every award in our market sector. Streaming Tank have been involved in some of the most challenging but successful live streams ever undertaken. Hi, this one? Yeah. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm from Blink TV. Um, we're based in London. I'm head of content. Um, we're a production and distribution company, and we do a lot of live streaming, um, in particular from festivals. Thank you. So the point of this morning's discussion is to um, separate the, the streaming aspects. Of course, um, there is a lot of confusion between the distribution of streaming and the live streaming. So we're going to kind of summarise that, and then we'll go into a bit more uh, detail as well. So uh, the use of the term streaming. Uh, Martin, can you define uh, streaming distribution for everyone, please? I, I think, the, yes, the, the obvious the first, first, first point the, is to use the word ephemeral, i.e. the access to the, uh, to the, to the audiovisual asset that you're looking at is in the moment, and you don't get to keep it on the device with, with which you're enjoying it. That's the critical element to it. And then pa perhaps when I, you ask me another question later, I'll make a, a, a couple of distinctions about in the audio streaming space between on-demand and non-on-demand, non, on, on or should I mention that now? Okay, so the, and obviously the streaming is divided down into on-demand streaming, which is where people can choose the specific um, piece of media that they're going to watch or listen to, or watch and listen to, um, as opposed to uh, streaming which is pre-programmed by somebody else, either seeded or, in, in, in the case of true internet radio, determined by somebody else's curation. Uh, uh, decisions. So on the one hand, you'd have Last FM and Pandora in non-on-demand, and on, in on-demand, you'd have Spotify and Persona and Deezer. Thank you, Martin. And uh, Chris, can you define uh, live music streaming? Yes, certainly. Um, it, uh, it's really falling into the place of brand, brand cross-promotion, um, the live streaming of festivals and gigs, including pay-per-view and sponsorship-led. Perfect. That was a good summarise. Um, so um, to move on to uh, focusing on a bit of the music di streaming distribution from Martin at Persona, how can artists really get to grips with the uh, streaming uh, that's distributed and focus it to the right people, i.e. their fans? Can I have my slide now? <laughs> yes, well, I mean, the first thing that was worth saying is that uh, when Yvette posed the question that we're going to answer this morning about, you know, the importance or the apparent, the coming importance of streaming, the reality is that in 2013 that happened. And this slide, I don't know whether any, any of you saw it, but Paul Resnikoff used it in a blog post on Digital Music News, I think on the 4th of January, sometime like that. And it shows 103% growth in streaming in 2013 in the US um, for audio streaming, whatever it is, I can't make, make the figure out particularly, but it's about 35% on on-demand streaming of audio and video. Um, down, ad, album downloads were flat and song downloads decreased. So, you know, the age of streaming has come. It is becoming, if it is not already, the mainstream way for fans to consume, uh, to access um, music and music related uh, entertainment. Um. <laughs> um, can I ask the audience uh, if anyone has used uh, and benefited from uh, the distribution uh, of their? tracks through streaming, through streaming on demand or otherwise. Has anyone here got their tracks up on Spotify? You have? Okay, can I have a, is there a mic anywhere? We can have... No. 
Matthew while I come down here. So what do you have uh, for your streaming? Um, classics online, this is Naxos, Klaus Heimann. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And over here, you said you use streaming distribution? Yeah, sure. Xbox Music. It's kind of teaser or Spotify, very similar. And how do you find that? Do you, have you found it beneficial for your, for your music and you've, you, know, you get revenue from it? Uh, actually, I can listen whatever I want, whenever I want, and uh, just keep that on my mobile or PC. It just works. So as a user, you find it good. And are there any artists here that actually use it and get, get a revenue from it? You do? Uh, I use it. Um, I don't find it's very profitable, though. Uh, I, the streams, the numbers are good, but the, uh, doesn't, the, the money's, but it can bring live gigs in, which I find it quite concerning, actually, because I found that, obviously, the artist has lost a lot of money from streaming now. And if one of our big pots is live music, so if we now start streaming gigs, are we just going to have no income completely? That's a really good question. That's something we're going to go on to with the live streaming uh, questions as well. But also from the music streaming distribution, how can artists actually monetize this better? Yeah, I mean, that's the critical question, isn't it? Which is, which you, you've challenged us with, which is they are ma mass ex access um, channels. And therefore, in the case of Persona, we're looking to do serve billions of streams a year, and obviously it's therefore very hard for us to treat an individual artist, in a, any particular individual artist in, 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 a, in an individual way. It's very hard for us to be um, uh, you know, a, a deeply engaged promotion channel for the artist partners that we have on the platform. So we do do some curation, but it's oriented to the needs of users. I, I think perhaps you'd be reassured by that, because in the end what we've got to do is deliver a superior listening experience. So what we're trying to do is help users to find their way around the site, to find the music that they want to listen to in the most effective way. So having you know, uh, categorization by genre, having effective search, having some curation to, d to demonstrate to users what's coming onto the service that's new. But ultimately, it's very difficult for a streaming service, a mass streaming service, to do much for the individual artist, not surprisingly. But I, if I can speak up for a, for a competitor, I do think that Spotify has made a big effort to try and make sure that it's got as much of the world's music on its platform as it possibly can. I mean, Daniel uses that phrase, the world's music at your fingertips or some such. Um, and he's made a big effort to incorporate um, some of the smaller distribution channels like CD Baby, get their music from their artists onto the platform. So I do think that streaming music is doing its bit to make sure that it's giving uh, access to the, to the channel to, to, to artists. And, um, and I suppose then the, the streaming distribution channel should be used as promotion, like you said, to, to get more gigs in, rather than the parts of pennies or, or cents that you may get from the, from the actual revenue. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, moving on now, if you don't mind, sorry. Um, to uh, how artists and venues and events and festivals can utilise the uh, internet streaming uh, to promote themselves and you know, possibly gain revenue. And I'll pass you over to Chris now from Streaming Tank to answer that very big question. Thank you. Um, actually, before I go into that, I'm actually going to pass it over to Christina because one, I can come in to, uh, and talk about how we've done stuff and, on gigs and how we've worked out ways of monetizing, etc. But before we do that, one of the questions that always comes up is in regards to clearance and rights. It's one of the biggest problems when it comes down to festivals. And I'm, I just happen to be sitting right next to someone who has a huge expertise in that. Um. Um, before I answer that question, any publishers in the house? <laughs> because publishing is one of the most complicated elements of um, audiovisual rights streaming, and it depends on the platform, as you probably know. So really, YouTube is, um, is one, Facebook's another. There's, there's plenty of others where you can do audiovisual live streaming, but um, it really does come down to clearing the rights. And if you're, it's, it's different if you're talking about a single artist doing an, uh, streaming their own gig, because presumably in that case, they're sort of, it's pretty st it's straightforward to clear. But we, f we clear a lot of festival... Um, performances each summer we have a platform called festivo on youtube um <clears throat> and we streamed four or five festivals last year from multiple stages and we're clearing a lot of bands so two three hundred bands each summer um and and that is that is a task in itself and obviously you know it's a it's an element that you can't overlook um there's obviously label artist clearances but the publishing side of it is is always the most complicated um youtube's quite YouTube's actually the most straightforward in some ways, but other platforms, the publishers really need to <laughs> step up and make it easier to unlock some of the potential for artists in terms of making money, I think. 
So in terms of the question that was posed by you, how do you not lose out on any revenue, um, you know, to gain revenue then from the live streaming as they do from the distribution streaming, that would be a way to go forward. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's just, it's a big topic in its own right and probably not one we can get into in great de bit of detail now, but publishing is, um, you know, publishing on digital platforms is complicated. It's, it's very difficult. To do. There's no sort of easy blanket licenses that people can, can access from a, from a worldwide perspective. And therefore, I, I, I personally think it's restricting the growth of that particular market because it's restricting which platforms you can stream on. Um, YouTube is... As I said, everyone knows pretty much that YouTube's got blanket licenses in place, um, but other platforms don't, and, and not everyone takes the same level of responsibility. Or it's, not, it's not so much that, it's more the, um, the model and the infrastructure isn't there to make it easy enough for people to do it <laughs> no, exactly, quickly. Exactly, and, and Chris, you, you um, kind of work on, develop, or your company works on developing these, these um, embedded players to certain formats, such as Twitter to yeah. make it easier for, for, for streaming to happen. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, if, we, if we move slightly off festivals, I'm very happy to move back onto festivals shortly. Um, if we look about promotion of artists, etc., cetera, um, there is now a huge number of opportunities in regards to promotion of bands and, and releases, especially on things like Twitter. When, when you're looking at promoting, promoting any brand and take, it, take an artist as a brand, you're trying to do two things, on, on especially involved in the internet. One is fluidity, how fast you can get a message out there and pass, get people to pass that message on to other people. Because we're talking about a conversation here, and not just a conversation that you are having with your target audience, but also the conversation that now it's having back to you, and more importantly, the conversation they're having with each other. And platforms such as Twitter is ideal for doing that. But the other thing you're trying to do is also create stickiness as well. So you also want, to, you also want people looking at that content and reacting to that particular content. So if I just give an example of how we've done this in the past, um, last year we were approached by EMI um, to, um, uh, to look, help and look at the launch for, um, for Blur for two tracks, uh, it's Under the West Way and Puritan. Um, originally they just wanted to stream it everywhere and we, we had some long conversations with EMI and said, well why don't we just launch this inside Twitter and use every other platform to go and push into this Twitter stream. And, as well, uh, and rather than just streaming the launch of that, the way that we did it, so we were, we were filming on top of, uh, on top of Damon's uh, flat in West London. And, that, and the launch was at 6.45 in the evening. So from nine o'clock in the morning, we, we started embedding a countdown clock inside Twitter. And then at the seemingly random times each hour, we would roll over from that countdown clock to exclusive content or an interview or backstage footage. During this time, we, we were, it was looking after both stickiness because people didn't want to miss out on anything and also fluidity because people kept on retweeting and retweeting. So we started trending within the first two or three hours and it was the largest conversation being had on Twitter at that moment worldwide. So by the time it hit 6, 6.45, the audience by that time was massive. We then ran the first track, filmed it, it all went out live. We then, at the end of that first track, rolled over um, and then they had a live Q&A session on Twitter why we desperately mastered up the audio and the video and placed that up on iTunes around the world. Then after that half an hour Q&A, they then rolled over and did the, we rolled over to do, did the second live, Puritan. At the end of that, we then rolled over and then people could click directly through to iTunes. And because of that, and because of that process, which is actually a really simple process it went through, that the Under the Westway went to number one. I think it's in 22 minutes worldwide. Now, if, we'd, if we hadn't had that conversation with the audience throughout the day, the, the time to number one would have been substantially reduced. Now, we have an advantage because we have technology embedded directly into Twitter so we can do things like that. I and mean, we're the live, main live streaming partner for almost every social network. But in fact, anyone else can use that same sort of process as long as they realize they're actually having a conversation with their target audience and actually knowing where their target audience is. Sorry, Sorry thank you. So that's a perfect example of how uh, live event streaming can actually be completely joined up with um, distribution of, of, of tunes because, um, as Chris said, the... Uh, the um, uh, recorded audio was, uh, was mastered and then sent up straight to iTunes for distribution through that streaming network. So that's how you can monetize and, and you use your content to promote. So that's the, the content is the key. 
which is what we'll move on to, on to next, which is the festival feedback. Um, Becky from uh, Liverpool Sound City um, did give us a brilliant quote, and uh, I will read it for you. It's a brilliant way to enable people who can't or don't want to go to a festival to see the artist, and it's great for advertisers who want to reach bigger audiences. For a lot of people, the live experience will always be preferable as festivals aren't always about what's happening on stage, it's about the escape from reality. And, uh, and until that's replicated on camera, streaming won't be able to replace that. That's a festival's point of view. What's your response to that? Um, I actually agree with her because we have that, a lot of our festival partners say the same thing and um, that's the same response we give them is that going to a festival, seeing a band perform live is always going to be a completely different experience. You, you, can't, draw a par- you can't really draw a parallel between them, you know. Um, you know, there's something, that's what's special about live music, it's unique. Um, and watching it on a, on a video serves a different, serves a different purpose. Um, and actually, the marketing benefits are great. And obviously, the, the beauty of digital is it can be geo-blocked. It can be, you can, you know, if, if somebody really was concerned, they really could switch off certain countries if they, want, if they weren't that concerned about ticket sales, for example. Um, so we, we do come across it, but on the whole, the, the number of festivals we work with um, is huge, and, and actually, they're all, they all see the benefits from a marketing perspective, and actually, so did the artists, just back to your point, um, Chris. It, you know, we, we did, um, for example, we did Lovebox. One of the festivals we did last year was Lovebox, and, uh, you know, the, the traffic on, social media traffic around certain performances for certain bands is huge. People, you know, people were wanting to watch it, and, and this is people worldwide, not people in London that are going to the festival. Um, so it does work. And also within the festival itself, um, so the artists aren't losing it. You don't lose out on the, um, on the promotion. The promotion aspect of streaming is huge, both on the distribution and the live uh, side, um, is the people within the festival can still get the content that's being streamed live because they can get it on their mobile phones and interact that way. So it's, it's actually not just the people outside the festival walls or the event walls, it's the people within it too. That's right. Um, in fact, actually, it's not really kind of central to this discussion. But we, have a, we also work with... Um, festivals in terms of managing the screens either side of the stage so we have an interactive way for live audiences to engage with the festival and with the performances on stage as well and there's a good example on the uh, on the screen then now for you the media wall that uh, streaming tanks actually developed which can be um you know used to to interact with uh, with festival goers or event goers at at site yeah i mean there's the <clears throat> There's a huge amount which can be done now, and so so much. Remember, we we have social brains. We love to we we love to share. We love to we love to be shared too. Um, um, and why you start looking at what is happening within social, and also looking at all the other areas of monetization in regards to brands and. You know, when you start talking about numbers, you know, there's, there's, there's always the argument, and I'm probably going to ruin one of your slides coming up about pay-per-view versus, um, versus sponsorship, but it's always an interesting one, because the debate's always been out for a long time about, about pay-per-view, because we know, we know that pay-per-view can um, bring, um, it, it's a revenue earner, um, it does bring down the audience an awful lot. Um, we deal, deal with pay-per-view. We also deal with a lot more in regards to sponsorship um, for, for not just things like festivals, but for, for instance, an awful lot of gigs. So if you look, if you look at the, the BT Infinity series that we ran with um, uh, Love Live, where we, we ran a series, of, a series of gigs on the top of BT Tower um, with people like Visual Kicks, etc. cetera, um, <clears throat> hugely successful. Um, monetized by um, um, by the sponsor, which was was BT, um, the HP series, which uh, which we ran with with Google, with Ellie Golding, etc. Um, <coughs> um, and then you start looking at brand tie-ups. So um, recently, we we did we did brought up with Maroon Five and Coca Cola, uh, where they had to where the band had to write, record, and perform a song in 24 hours. Um, that was all socially based. Um, the audience on that was massive. I think, I think we had about, for that hour, I think we had about 350,000 unique coming on to that. It was, once again, the largest trending um, conversation across all the social networks. For the, the band, as well as the monetization, which obviously the band had from, from the brand, a um, huge amount of promotion for both, uh, for both band and for, and for the brand as, as well. So there's a lot of win-wins in, in, in it. And it, you know, it's, it's funny being here back at Medium, because I haven't been to Medium for a few years, and last time, last time I was here, most of the industry were going around being uh, quite down in the dumps and miserable with itself, saying it's all going wrong, etc. But actually, now, now people are realizing 
realizing the model is changing and the model the model is there's so much of it is looking at on uh, is looking at online the audience is um the the audience is a wider audience on however that however that that materializes itself and people are now thinking of new ways to promote promote music promote bands sell sell music and finding out other ways to uh, to bring in money through pay-per-view and sponsorship Thank you, Chris. And uh, I suppose the summary then is the fact that, uh, you know, the pre-promotion of both um, the distribution uh, services for streaming uh, your tracks and the live event streaming, the pre-promotion is the key and the promotion you get from those two avenues uh, because you've got the good content, whether the content is the um, promotional schedule that you use through Persona, for example, and then the track because people like it and the, and the forwarding and the knock-on effect of that or the content that you use um, with the event of your live um, stage show. Um, has anyone in the audience done a gig and had it live streamed? Any hands at all? No one here has done that. Live streaming virgins all over yeah, the place. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Let's try it out. <laughs> um, can I go to um, ask in the audience if you've got any questions for both uh, the um, streaming distribution side, such as Persona, Spotify, that kind of thing, or the live streaming? Sorry, I came in a bit late. So can I ask uh, what platform you use for live streaming and what, what platforms you found successful? Uh, oh, oh, right. Um, let me answer that one. Um, obviously, we... If, it's across lots of different platforms and, 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 and every event and, uh, is, um, uh, is different. Um, a lot of, the, lot of what we're doing is directly into YouTube. And we work directly with YouTube and YouTube's partners. Um, um, we have the advantage that we can also live, as in streaming tank, can live stream directly into Twitter. Um, but I realise that other people have certain issues involved in that. But also down to down to the the actual sites itself. Um, one of the, um, uh, in fact, one of the festivals that we've that I've, that we've done with Blink um, is, was V Festival, um, where we were on for that we were streaming all th independently all three stages. Um, and that was going up into, onto, the, um, onto the V Festival main website. It was also going up onto their Facebook pages. It was also going up to cha the Channel 4 um, website, the E4 website, um, and also the band's websites as well. And so we were setting, and that, we were setting that all up so, so the bands would only have, um, um, they would only have their gig not the entire festival up onto their sites or linked onto things like geo, geo targeting and geo blocking as well because of um, because of access rights around the place so you, know, uh, you can stream onto anywhere does that answer your question or were you talking about actual platforms as in online and mobile because these days you should be able to go onto everything no that does answer my question thank you very much thank you and uh, just to add on to that as well actually um, the um, we'll go to you in a second sorry uh, is to um uh put the question to those artists and management and labels that don't have huge budgets. I mean, we, um, we use Ustream uh, and we find that the content delivery can be astronomical if we don't go to a, a uh, uncapped monthly fee, which can also be quite large. So how, how you know, can you answer that question maybe? I'm not sure if I can actually. <laughs> um, well, because we, because we mostly stream to the two the two big streaming platforms we've worked with are um, YouTube, where obviously don't have that issue, and we did an, a live stream for Xbox Studios last summer as well, and obviously we didn't have that issue with them either. Okay. But I, I, I know it's a diff, I know it's a tricky one because it's you just don't know how many streams. There, there, are, there, there are other other avenues coming out from it, um, especially especially on the, on YouTube now. You, now anyone can anyone can live stream into YouTube. There are the YouStream and the live stream process is um, in place um, they um, if you have a smaller artist with not much budget that is a that is a good way to go there's its pluses and minuses obviously of, of using things like that and you you can be restricted on some of the things that you do but then again um, you pay for what you get brilliant thank you okay my question is um, uh, Christian Arndt from a newspaper in Germany uh, my question is um, do you see this really because I hear the word promotion a lot uh, on the behalf of the artist, or rather the composers, authors, publishers, do you think uh, live streaming should be compensated, and who, who should who should be paying for, uh, the publishing fees? Because YouTube doesn't in Germany, at least. Uh, Germany is, is unique. If you really? Talk, if you talk to anyone at YouTube, Germany is a slightly dirty word. 
So in fact, but the reason well, for us, YouTube versa. is a dirty word. Yeah, that, that, but the, and the only reason is because their 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 blanket agreement, I, and I understand that their blanket agreement covers worldwide apart from Germany. So there is there is there is a problem with publishing rights in Germany uh, specifically. Well, it's I think it's really simple. They just simply don't want to pay per stream or pay per view. They rather want only to give a share of the revenue that they're making. But that's not that's not the the author's perspective. So. What do you think? Is it generally a, a, a just should the artists be happy with being promoted, or should they earn money from the streams and how much? My personal view. This is just my personal view. Is that I, I saw the parallel between um, the broadcast industry and the digital industry, and the way that it works in on TV, for example, is that every song that's performed on TV is logged on a cue sheet and then it's registered by the collection societies and someone gets paid for that. And the reason it works is because TV is such a long-established model that people know, the, the broadcasters know where the advertising revenue, they, they've got a forecast, they pretty much know what they're going to make in advertising. So they, there's a, a sort of defined pot of money, if you like, with a precedent and a future that they can offset it against and feel confident about paying it out. And the, problem, the, the future of digital streaming in terms of things like YouTube and other platforms is that they don't have... Well, actually, I think YouTube's probably a slightly different example, but in print, the principle of digital, the digital world generally is that it's very difficult for people to forward, forward cast how much revenue is going to be coming in, and so that's why they do it on a per... You know, on a revenue share basis versus on a finite amount of money shared out regardless of what money's actually coming in because it's got to be a sustainable business model going forwards otherwise it just the whole thing will just collapse and nobody will do anything and nobody will be able to do anything and and the opportunity will be missed completely so I, I'm, I'm on the fence because I kind of understand you know obviously understand the artists and publishers perspective but my view is that unless everyone completely works together on it the whole thing will just disintegrate and it will go away. Well, it won't go away, but it's, you know, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have perennial questions like that coming up all the time. And I think that's a... a sorry. It does. I think that's a very good way of how the, both the um, live stream and the streaming distribution uh, uh, should be, you know, they should end up working on the same format and benefiting the artist in terms of uh, the, uh, the licensing and, and revenue from that. And... Um, and that is when the streaming will become mainstream and, and it won't be such a still waters run deep. They'll actually you know, be making waves in it. Sorry. There was too many puns in there, wasn't there? <laughs> so thank you for listening. If you want to talk to any of my uh, panellists um, one-to-one or personally, do approach them afterwards. I want to thank Chris and... Chris, it's Christine, isn't it? Christine and uh, Martin for joining me and uh, for you uh, listening to us. And uh, do come up to us for any more questions. Thank you.